Lisa, welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast. Lee, welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast. Welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast, Paula. Hello, and welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast. Today, we are joined by Carol Glenn. Hello, and welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast. Today, we are joined by Julian Dorr from Football from Football. And welcome to the See Me Be Me podcast, Elsa. On your way up through um, your career, Lisa, what would you say are the three unique skills that have helped to make you as successful as you are today? Uh, I think, I think firstly, I think, like I said before, I think the traveling and spending yeah. lots of time with different people and different cultures, that's really helped me in terms of my interpersonal skills. I think I'm yeah. very fortunate in so far as you can drop me into pretty much any situation and I can handle it. And I think that goes back to my childhood and traveling and meeting lots of different people. So I think that kind of having the ability to operate at different levels um, in any, any, any organization, I think is really, really key. Um, I think something else that's really important is, um, is, is a, a good work ethic, mm. you know, to, to get to any level of success, you have to be willing to put in the work. There are no shortcuts, yeah. Yeah. you know, I know you, people see these get rich quick schemes, all this kind of, but, but to be yeah. perfectly yeah. honest with you, you know, okay, yeah, I'm successful now, but I have worked for over 20 years to get to this point. So I think that's the other thing as well. You know, I am a hard worker. Um, you know, if I have to work seven days a week, I will do that. I think that's really, really important. And I think as well, what's important is um, the ability to kind of give back. I think it's really important that as you move for, um, as you move up in your career, you ensure, yeah. especially as black people, that we create opportunities and open doors for others to follow us. I don't want to be the last. I'm happy to be the first, but I'd like to mm. think that years from now when I'm not here, there'll be lots of other people that look like me and from other, other marginalized communities who are, who are blazing a trail as well. So I think for me, what's really, really important is my success is not just about, you know, my mom always says the skills that you have, it's not just about what you do for yourself, but your, mm. the skills that you have is, is about what you do for others. And, and for me, I think that's, in, that's, that's a very, very important to me. Do you know, when you were a kid, did, did you ever dream of like setting up and, and running your own business or yeah, what did eight year old Lee Chambers want to be? Yeah, so I suppose it was interesting, you know, in growing up in the north and starting life on a council estate, you you don't have the biggest aspirations. Uh, yeah. but I've always been a little bit, you know, different and a bit nonconformist. Uh I have a like a like most people do, I have a crazy uncle. And that crazy <laughs> uncle was like deep into computers in the late eighties and early nineties. And he just got me a Commodore sixty four. And that's what I was tapping away on that, waiting half an hour for the tape to load up. Uh, I was just like, actually, maybe one day I'll do something with, with computers, with tech. Like, this is new stuff. Like, I can do this, but my parents have no idea. Um, so I'd always started to think, I'll probably do something technically. Uh, I was decent at school. When I applied myself, I was pretty good. Uh, I didn't apply myself as much as I could have, probably not. Um, but I think a lot of people can say that. Um, but yeah, I suppose as well, I was always quite entrepreneurial. Yeah. Really, big thing for me was my dad worked like 12 hour shifts grafting as like a manual engineer. There was a point where my mum was working three jobs, you know, because they, they wanted social mobility for me and my younger brothers. And, mm. you know, my parents grafted. That's given me a work ethic as well and seeing how valuable that is. But also, I remember thinking when I was like eight, nine, like, parents are like never here um yeah. and it's because they're trying to create a better future for us but i thought you know when, I, when i've got kids i don't want to be kind of stuck in a factory for 12 hours not being able yeah. to see my kids and just working just to pay stuff i thought if i can build something myself i can have that control i can shape my life and you know i was that kid who was like buying multi-pack cans rolling up to secondary school with a cool box and selling them for a quid each <laughs> um and at one point, actually, you know, the teachers stopped us doing it. The teachers, like, clamped, clamped down because apparently it was health and safety uh, and we were carrying around, like, foodstuffs and drinks. Yeah. Uh, and I think it got to a point where, you know, I'm there with, like, two cool boxes with wheels on, <laughs> a PE kit on my back, you know, like, guy forgets his books for English, but he's got all this stuff with him, like, <laughs> not setting the best example. 
so I've always had a, a little bit of that spirit. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make something. Make something of my own. Uh, and always been a little bit like I want to build something that I can control, so I'm not, you know, like my own parents working every hour God sends, and then yeah. don't don't see my kids. And uh, when you're speaking to, um, let's say, um, some of these young black girls when they're beginning, let's say, their journeys in terms of wanting to go into careers within STEM, do a lot of them can they do they almost because uh, you know with the way things are at the moment, they're not not a lot of younger black people are uh, encouraged to go into careers within STEM. So does it take, um, you know, a lot of, well, not necessarily like convincing, but is it hard to get them into that stage in terms of what in a career is STEM? Or are you finding more young black girls are now more motivated to go into this uh, as a career path? Excellent, excellent question. So just to give you a context, a background context to this, when I used to teach computing science, yeah, same yeah. around I came qualified in 2003. My girls were getting A's and A stars. So I don't know what happened from when they left me to go to college to go, I don't, I don't, that I'm trying to understand. So now that I'm doing this Be Me Disinclusion program, I'm talking to some of the girls. They're like the same miss, we've never heard of STEM. That's what you're talking about. Just miss, don't know what it is. So when I go in there, what I do, I make, I personalize what STEM is. Yeah, I talk, yeah. I, I ask them, what is it that they want to get involved with? I don't want to give you too much of my secrets, but, you know, I use my teaching techniques and I use me as a person to try and make them understand that STEM is not separate. It underpins society. It underpins our everyday lives. And when I explain that to them with my stories and the resources that I have, the girl says, OK, so we go in and they don't know what STEM is. By the end of the day, they know what STEM is and a lot of them want to do AI. A lot of them want to be a bioengineer. A lot of them want to get to chemical engineer. A lot of them want to go into constructions. A lot, a lot of them want to build bridges. They're like, Miss, we didn't know all this. We didn't understand. You just made it more simpler. Like, even though we know that, you know, a lot of them saying that Web3 is dead, I disagree. But when I started to explain to them what the metaverse was, what yeah. NFT were, what Ethereum was, what smart contract, they were like, Miss, we didn't get it, but we do. And I explained to them, about an avatar, how they can make money. They're like, we've got a letter saying, Miss, when you came, we thought you'd just come to do another boring old Black History Month talk. But when you spoke about the Web3 web and how we can get involved and how we are the future, he said, yeah. so I'm never getting into, um, into tech, but I tell you what, Miss, you, you, what you did, you sparked something in me and I want to set up my own business. I want to become an entrepreneur. So it's down to the person that's delivering it. Okay, I have a passion. I've created a culture that no matter what, our girls are not getting left behind and they are going to get involved in one way or the other. It's, it's not rocket science. They will get involved, but it's how how they're going to get involved. Yeah. And we need yeah. all hands on deck, as Michelle Obama said, because I can't do this inside. I cannot do it alone. Yeah. I have to work with you guys. I have to understand your perspective so you can talk to my girls. Yeah, because you may look at it different, differently from me. And they may like, ah, oh, I like the way Valeria said it. I like the way Nala said it. Let's have a look at it that way. It may work. It may not. So what? We learn from it and we move on. And that's how mm. we're approaching it. Nobody is perfect. And have you seen much of a change in the motorsport industry in recently, yourself, Carol? Um, it's In terms yes, of like, attitudes to diversity? Yes. Yes and no. So you get... Slightly less banter now because people are now wa watching what they say yeah. because you can't now say certain things. But you get microaggressions, which is more subtle. Yeah. Um, so um, th the other change I've seen, obviously, there are more females involved in motorsport now. So we're not seen as being the weaker sex, the ones that you know people think are going to are going to start crying at the at, at the at the drop of a hat. We yeah. can cope. We can cope with lots of hard decisions. We can make, uh, there's a lot of females out that are good clerks and we can cope with all sorts of situations that are thrown at us. We can handle when there's accidents. We can handle when, you know, we've got to tell somebody off in a, in a judicial. Um, you've got females being um, judges, um, mm. working on start line. Um, you know, throughout F1, you can see there are a few more females now being visible. It's still not enough, but there's, you know, you're, you're not, Looking at spot the spot the female anymore really yeah, now. Yeah. Um, yeah. They've stopped making a lot of sport now having grid girls. So girls aren't just seeing oh all they want to do is put lipstick on and wear makeup. 
that yeah. sort of um, has gone away. But you've got, for a person of colour, especially, mm -hmm. you've got the microaggressions where you have to work harder to prove yourself. Yeah. You get, you get um, sometimes passed over for a less experienced person because they don't want to see things with putting you in charge of something. And um, they rather have somebody who's got little or no experience. And then when it all goes wrong, then they then come and say, oh, could you look after this? Or could you do that? Because we know you can do that. And again, you have to just play the waiting game sometimes. Yeah. You know, so it's a whole different battle you've mm -hmm. got. The battle I had 30 years ago is different than the battle I have now. So after five entrepreneurial children, that's, that's amazing. I mean, and they've just thrown themselves into the deep end, like starting their own businesses. And just going on to my next question, Sabrina, this is a bit an, an interesting one, but seeing as they started their own businesses, they, I imagine they're quite a, your children are all quite a confident um, individuals, but because many of the young people that we've worked with in the past, they've had this sort of almost like this fear of failure. So when your children were starting off on their like entrepreneurial journeys, did you teach them not to be scared of failure? Do you know, that's a great question. Funny enough, I had one of my children who had a fear of success. They, oh, wow. they knew how capable they were and they didn't want to do what they could do. They were so fearful of how big they will become. So um, we didn't really have a fear of success, cons um, failures consistently. So we had, had a mixture. But I think the interesting way we do things. So one of the things, I, when you get to know me, I tend to use words that people understand, but then I explain it. So let me just give you a, a brief understanding. I think I, I'm a true believer that every child is creative. So my kids are not necessarily what I would say entrepreneurial, they are naturally yeah. organically what they were made to be, right? Every child yeah. likes to draw, build, and you know, do stuff with their hands. But in the real world, we have to use these words so everyone understands that. So what I love most about my kids, and I always say this, is that it's not a see me, just look at me, it's come join us. So there's nothing yeah. Yeah. special about my kids. I know I love them, I'm always gonna pick them, but if I be entirely honest, if I'm talking to a listener, in your house, there are kids and they've all got talents. They're no different to mine. Every child writes stories, every child draws pictures. The only thing we did differently is publish them. The only thing we do differently is use the public eye, digital platforms like social media to be a fly on the wards, wards to see them create. So going back to your question, we part of our family motto is there's no such thing as failure, only feedback. So the reality is we don't, look at failure as if, okay, we failed, go, go and hibernate, go and sit down. Yeah, yeah. It's really about what do you learn from that experience? And one of Paolo's mentors, actually, someone he's collaborating with, is called Ari Rastiger. He's written this book called The Gift of Failure. You see, we've got so much of this, you know, run away, we're failing and embarrassment and fear around failure. Failure means we're growing. Failure means we're moving. Absolutely. Failure Absolutely. means we're trying. So we just have a different perception of what that means. So we fail often, we fail forward, <laughs> we laugh at our failures, we feel embarrassed about our failures. And the reality is the teaching to answer your question specifically is it's emotion. So we're not gonna go, okay, I can't be sad or embarrassed sometimes. It's part of growing up. So we definitely experience the whole variation of our feelings. I want to just ask him, what would you say are, let's say three skills or traits that you picked up on your journey since you started football for football that uh, essentially makes you as successful as you are today. And successful that I'm going to be as well. Um, be, yeah. Perseverance, first and foremost. Perseverance, passion, purpose. Three Ps. So the perseverance is to keep going. Yeah. The purpose, do it for a reason. And the passion, you've got to love it. So yeah. if you want to drill them down, that, will, that, that then helped me hold a camera. That helped me learn how to do wireframing to build out architectures for, for wireframes for, for, for websites. That helped me build our own proprietary algorithms. That helped me work out IP and branding. But you've got to have those things in place. You've got to be prepared. It's like, it's, it's, it's one of those. It's throwing a ball up into the air. At some stage, you know, it's got to come down, but you don't need to come down straight away because it's over. So throw it up yeah. as high as you can. And let's see what comes down. It might come down with snow. Might come. Might not come down. Might just might. It might hit the sun and it might dissipate. Then you've really yeah. won. So there are the three things really.
just starting out with your career and all the skills that you picked up um, along your journey, what would you say are the three skills uh, or traits that you've picked up on your journey that's helped to make you the success that you are today? Ooh, three skills. I would say consistently learning. And that by that, I literally mean continuously putting yourself out there. And that could be formally or informally. Clearly, I've done that formally um, through all my education, well, formal education. But yeah. I would say that the entrepreneurial ventures that I've gone through have t- taught me as m- as much. So, and I continue to do this. So, for example, yesterday I had an interview for the Quantic um, MBA Business School. Now, whether I get in, I guess we'll find out at some point. Um, but it's just continuously putting yourself out there to continuously learning. Um, Two, I would say adaptability. Um, you have to be able to go with the flow. I think we've happened. We've seen that with COVID. Everyone had to pivot, change, find different ways. But that is literally your everyday life as a business um, owner, especially in entrepreneurship. And really for successful life, um, you have to be able to pivot. And I would say thirdly is people, right? Relationships. People do business with people. You might be competent, but if someone doesn't like you, they will not do business with you and they will not succeed with you. And I think sometimes we think competence can overshadow likability or overshadow being an arrogant piece of work, (laughs) but it cannot. Um, So I think it's just being able to build those relationships and leverage your networks and just be a nice person. Yeah. 